and welcome to the Rugby Sevens Roller Coaster. We're here to take you on the ups, the downs, the twists, the turns, and the excitement that is Premier Rugby Sevens. The sports league taking over the US with some of the best athletes our sport had to offer. I'm Dallas Stafford, former USA Sevens player and current World Rugby commentator. And I'm Robin McDowell, former Canadian Sevens player and current international coach. Together, we'll bring you the latest PR Sevens news. Welcome to your new home for Sevens Rugby. Hello and welcome to episode four of the Rugby Sevens Roller Coaster, a North American inspired podcast that focuses on the Premier Rugby Sevens and also the HSBC World Rugby Sevens series. What a blast we've had telling the stories about rugby legends across our first podcast, the Rugby Hive. And now this one shines a light on the most colorful sport on the planet, Rugby Sevens. Interest is at all time high, of course, here in the United States with season three of the PR Sevens kicking off this weekend on June 17 at the stunning Q2 Stadium in Austin, Texas. The Lone Star State will welcome four women's sides, four men's sides for the Eastern Conference kickoff with a proper fan festival kicking off at 3 p.m. local time. And what a cool format. Viewers and the crowd will be attending and watching the semifinals right after the start making the high stakes rugby, followed by Black Joe Lewis performing and then back to the rugby with a bronze medal and finals will take place. You can watch it live on CBS Sports in the USA. Hydration partner Good Sport is on board as well, so great to see them join the PR7s. All the matches will hopefully be uploaded very soon on the YouTube page afterwards for PR7, so our international viewers can keep up to date and see how the superstars got on. And so, just to review, Rugby 7's roller coaster guests we've had so far. If you haven't caught up, catch up on these brilliant episodes. Episode 1, we featured USA 7's captains Naya Tapper and Perry Baker. Episode 2, we saw USA 7's captain from years gone by. Abigail Stytus and current World 7 Series champion Brady Rush from New Zealand. Our last episode, we saw former USA 7s captain Madison Hughes and Blackburn 7s and 15s legend Stacey Walker. Well, this episode is no different. It goes off like a frog in a sock. And that's right, guests. We include the spicy American sensation Corey Jones and New Zealand rugby legend Ruby Tui. Plus, we chat with director of operations for PR 7s, Sean Snacks, Linda Smith, Jeepers Creepers, Robin. What a bunch of sensational quackerburgers. Nothing but legends all around. I'm excited that we're kicking off in Austin this week. I'll be watching on my couch. You'll be in the booth, Dallin. Any predictions ahead of this uh, this big kickoff in the Eastern Conference? Well, all I know is it's going off like a cut snake, my friend. That's all I can say. <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, I was I was chirping uh, Coach Andrew Lockie of the defending champion headliners that we'll see him in the in the finals in Washington here in a, in a couple months. But uh, yeah, just super excited to. You know, it's been a long 10 months build up in the off season and everybody's ready to go and excited. Yeah, it's almost here. We can't wait. All right, let's quickly look at the World 7 Series. Well, while they're still deciding what dates will be announced for next season, there's plenty of sevens happening around the world ahead of the 2024 Olympic Games in Paris. Recently, this past weekend, the Rugby Europe Sevens Championship took place. Two stops. Their first stop was in the Algarve. In the men's side of the competition, Ireland defeated Georgia in the final. What a special performance from the Georgians. They don't even play on the Sevens World Series. So it's a remarkable finish for them because in third place game, Great Britain took on France. So France uh, got the gold medal there against GB. And then uh, Portugal beat, beat Spain. And Spain have experience in the World Sevens Series. So a lot happening there on the men's side. On the women's side of things, France won the Algarve Sevens against Great Britain. Ireland took third, beating Poland. But, of course, we said, meanwhile, back in the U.S., let's preview this weekend's PR7, the Eastern Conference kickoff, Robs. Well, what's exciting in year three is it's a semifinal final, so just straight into the knockouts, um, which changes the approach definitely for uh, the coaches and the players, but most importantly, the fans. How exciting is that? You know, uh, be on our edge of his seats and also from a like a preparation standpoint, it's, you know, you can't, can't be sleepy that first game. And often I talk to coaches and players just about, you know, the first game of sevens uh, competition that it takes a little while to adjust to the speed, even if you're New Zealand or Fiji or whoever. So right off the hop, it, it, it changes that approach. They're going to have seven subs and and kicking off at Q2 Stadium in Austin this weekend. For the women, it's going to be the Steel Toes versus the Headliners, the team and the locals in, in match two. For the men in the in the semifinals, it'll be the Steel Toes versus the locals and then team versus Headliners. So very, very exciting. And then the following week will be in Minnesota for the Western openers and uh, kicking things off will be the men the rhino loggerheads versus the experts the loonies versus the retrievers and then for the women the retrievers versus the rhinos loggerheads and of course everybody's favorite loonies versus uh irene's uh, experts so very very exciting for the fans and then again it's it's all points and and every point counts if you want to go to dc in august are you going to give us a prediction for the champion this weekend in austin 
Uh, well, I'm going to have to go with the headliners. They've yeah. got, you know, I got to respect uh, Lockie as a coach. He's he's brought back the majority of his team, and if it ain't broke, don't fix it. He's got some, you know, some Kiwis coming back. Uh, Monique Coffey's been actually training with Canada. She's a dual citizen. Uh, I coached against her a few weeks ago in an X-Gen competition. She looked very fit. Last year, she was still a, a rough diamond, and uh, this year, she's a little more polished and even fitter. So I'm going to have to tip my head at headliners, but... I mean, to be fair, the locals, they got they got former guest Waka. It's gonna be very exciting. I really don't know who's you know who's gonna end up on top. But uh for me, uh, as as a coach, it's gonna be in the Western Conference. I'm excited just to see it all unravel because it's gonna be a rolling of the dice the first week. It really is gonna be. And then on the men's side of things, any other guesses do you think uh, which two teams could be in the finals there? Yeah, I mean that's that's a great question. I can't say on the on the men's side. Um, again, headliners have the most ex- experience, and obviously, Tim. Hope, if he doesn't sub himself in, who who knows? But uh, they got the Canadian Rocket with Lucas Sheck back there flying. But uh, yeah, headliners would be heavy favorites on on the Eastern Conference because they again they they played last year. Three other teams being new, but it is exciting to see the locals and and the team back after they were there year one, weren't there year two, and they, they're making a comeback year three. I can't wait to uh, get the one-liners going team of the, with Ruby Tui in the booth as well, which is brilliant. So it's going to be a sensational weekend. Fans can visit PR7s.com to get your tickets for Austin. This weekend, of course, if you don't live in Austin or you're not coming for this weekend's tournament, the other four brilliant events, your tickets are there. It's going to be an unbelievable summer. Uh, merchandise is available as well for the fans. They can get those. All right, enough about us. Here is episode four of the Rugby Sevens Roller Coaster with Sean Snacks, Linda Smith, Corey Jones, and Ruby Tui. Please enjoy your sleek sensations. Well, rugby sensations, a very popular figure in the North American rugby landscape. And just like Madonna, he goes by one name alone. It is Snacks. Welcome to the Rugby Sevens roller coaster, my friend. Hi, Dallin. Hi, Robin. How are you too? Uh, we, we're great, buddy. Well, listen, I want to say Robin actually wanted to interview somebody else, but I said, no, we need to get you on. So, so first up, I've never asked you this. What is your favorite snack? Oh, you know, that's funny. You should say that. We discuss that quite often at events. And the hands down, Gushers seem to be the snack of choice at all events, whether it's a ball kid or it's uh, an event staff member or it's a coach who's sneaking into the tournament office to steal them, a.k.a. Robin. Yes, true. I'm I'm guilty, you know, for sure. Snack is snack is a legend. The first time I I met Snacks, I guess just first of all on a phone call, year one in the PR sevens, he's like, "Stop calling me Sean. It's got to be Snacks." I'm like, "On the first date, really? Like, come on!" And and uh, he just kind of set the tone as far as who he is and uh, his his character and welcoming. And then for the first day of seeing him sweating and and huffing gear and just being the most selfless guy, even though he was the man behind the scenes was great. And then getting to cruise down the California coast last year with him and, and actually to check out his favorite uh, fish taco place in his hometown in San Diego. And yeah, he's, uh, he's the hostess with the mostest and I'll be knocking on your door all summer. No, Robin, we actually met well before PR sevens, you were coaching Mexico at the 2018 rugby world cup. And as they took, tournament staff member i had to uh vouch for the a few of the teams that had you know had a few fun nights before they uh departed san francisco so yeah the mexican women's team had a great time in san francisco oh, no comment amazing. no, no comment. comment exactly that's that that's for another that's for another podcast you know are, 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 are you are you saying are you saying that the mexicans are, are known for having a good time i mean come on <laughs> No, no, no. I'm just saying I, I met you all there. I watched everybody go on down to the meeting rooms to to do analysis and, you know, I do a tournament wrap up. And it was great to meet you then and, and see what you're doing with Mexico. And super stoked that we get to work together now in PR7s. I love how it's come full circle for, you know, all three of us, really, because next you and I go way back. I, you probably have a better recollection of the of the year. Probably around the 16, 1700s, we met at a rugby event, and, and and it's been around the world. Yeah. Everywhere I go, you're there, either either working in different capacities, and it doesn't really matter. Why don't you give our, our audience, our, our listeners, a bit more insight into some of the roles you've done, um, some of the organizations you've worked with. And, and again, there probably have been yeah. quite a few moments where you may pinch yourself and be like, I can't believe I'm here. Uh, every day. Every day, really. I'm like... How did I get here? You know, and 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 truly, it's a nonlinear pathway. And you're right, Dallin. We've been at events. It's not even funny. Like I think I've lost count. Right? 
it started off my first event ever was in 2012 selling USA rugby Canterbury sweatshirts at a high school invitational and worked my way as a USA rugby regional event staff member still to this day I, sometimes I, I fill in where brandy and them need somebody was liaison officer for the all black sevens for over a decade which is where i got my start in sevens from 2008 in san diego all the way to 2019 in las vegas including the rugby world cup of 2018 where i did a dual role of team services manager and liaison officer manager and i was a liaison officer for the all blacks at the same time um through that i found coaching found that i could there's all these different roles behind the scenes that one could get involved in. You know, I didn't know there wasn't even a, an analyst back in the day, but there was a physio, there was an assistant coach, there was a manager, you know, learning like what the event staff did and stuff in San Diego and, and Vegas. So, you know, through that, I just sort of kept saying yes to lots of different events and, you know, worked up to being a team services manager within the USA rugby system, which ultimately saw me be the team services manager for the All Blacks when they came in 2014. And through that, uh, Tristan Lewis <laughs> took note of me and uh, became the assistant manager of the Eagles the year after. And that was a really interesting time because I was so immersed in both events and managing that I would manage the team from Sunday, you know, travel day on Sunday, manage the team throughout the week. And on Friday, I would disappear and go to the, the event staff hotel. And then I'd work the event and then Saturday night, I'd magically reappear. And one time, Ali Khalifi was like, hey, bro, where do you go? Like, why don't you come to the games with us? You know, and I was like, I'm actually there. I'm I'm the guy pushing you out on the tunnel or getting the balls to the referee or whatever. And that sort of gave me a window into that world. And um, I took over the full-time manager job in 2016 after the Rugby World Cup 2015 with John Mitchell and Phil Greening and Mike Friday and Rob Hoadley and all those guys. And um, at the same time, Managed the 2016 first iteration of pro rugby with the San Diego Breakers. Um, so I did those jobs at the same time. And concurrently through this entire time, I was also coaching either a seven side or a high school team or Coast Guard select side, you know, at, at the same time. 2017, I got brought to Minnesota to be executive director of Minnesota Youth Rugby and started coaching the Gophers and had sworn off uh, professional rugby for a while until Owen – and Kelly rang me in uh, late 2020 and asked me if I was interested in hearing a pitch. And uh, on my drive home from California from Christmas, me and Owen met virtually and I was in a gas station in Wyoming. And he just asked me what I thought about a sevens professional league and my jaw kind of hit the ground. And when I picked it back up, I said, I think that's great. But, you know, what does it look like? And he's like, we don't know yet. We'll figure it out. And, you know, how do you feel about equality? And, how would you take care of athletes? And, you know, three years later, here I am with PR sevens and, you know, <laughs> gone from rugby services, the director of rugby services, and now I'm the director of operations. So it's wild. It's a, it's a wild, wild ride. I think last count, I have a ball from every event I've ever worked. I think the last count is like 70. Right. And then there's even more that I've added. So, yeah. Oh, my goodness. I, I was going to say, I collect the, uh, you know, the credentials that you have because they're small and kind of easy. You, you collect a rugby ball. I mean, Snacks, you must be living in an eight-bedroom mansion by now. Uh, the missus thinks our house is Dick's Sporting Goods at time with how many <laughs> rugby balls and hit shields and pennies and, and jerseys and everything that is here. Yeah, I, I also have all my credentials, which is probably an easier thing to collect at this point. But, you know, it is what it is. Well, you need an academy like mine, snacks, because uh, I br I just brought another garbage bag full of full of stuff today, and I'm always I'm, I'm punctuality is a big thing for me. So whoever comes in early gets first dibs. So, but uh, unfortunately, the front row I have to borrow uh, borrow some kit to deliver those guys because <laughs> the extra smalls go quick. But uh, snacks, what could you what could you tell us about your current role at the PR sevens and how has it evolved over the last three years? My current role is director of operations. My day-to-day -day job is to, you know, put all the pieces into play that we need to operate the league on a daily basis and operate it in a sustainable manner, right? Whether that's budget or product or, you know, uh, kit or, or whatever else we do. So from, you know, working with the medical services manager or the venue operations team or the rugby services team, which each of those teams is anywhere from three to, you know, the medical staff, I think, 
over the course of the season, we'll see anywhere from 15 to 20 different people that'll come in there, you know, working with those folks to make sure they have what they need on a daily basis to, to operate. Right. And, and my philosophy is give the people what they need and give them the support that they need to do their job and do the things that they love doing. Coaches coach, players play, physios do what they do. You know, rugby services takes care of everyone off the field. Then you make sure everything looks good and feels good and the music's loud and everything's pumping. Um, there are some other odds and ends that, you know, we're putting into play some pieces entertainment wise that are new to PR sevens this year. I think you've seen, we, we've just contracted uh, black Joe Lewis and the honey bears in Austin. And uh, we've just hired, just contracted an, another musical act in Minnesota, Rafaela, who's a similar style to Taylor Swift, really soulful, I- entertaining product, right? We look at what we're doing is like a three act play, right? The rugby is the first thing. Then we go to our fan fest and our, our, our intermission between the, the knockout rounds and the semifinals finals. And, and we get the crowd pumped up. They see a good music act. They have, you know, buy some merchandise, have a few beverages. And then we bring everybody back into the stadium for third place and first place games to award those series points. You know, we're also, uh, it, it's, it's a big undertaking. We didn't do this last year on the scale that we're doing it. And it's, I'm, I'm the rugby, right? I know the rugby side. I could speak the language. And this year I've had to learn what is a booking agent? How much staging do we need? What's an amp? You know, how much backline gear do we need? How many horn players does Black Joe Lewis need? You know, and it's 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 a constant evolving uh, situation where I'm just challenged every day. I love it. It's so much fun, but a little stressful at times, as you can imagine. Well, Snacks, one thing that you've done really well from year one to two and two to three is you built a team around you. You know, a smart guy is, is, is working smarter. You don't micromanage. You trust people. You find the right people and you empower them just like a coach. And you're kind of your coach and, and all your different experiences have set you up for success. And, uh, you know, just on the on the coaching side or on the on the the team side, you know, I was just sharing with one of our, you know, Canadian Olympians. It's not not a loony quite yet, but might be later this summer. Just how wonderful it is to be a part of the PR sevens and just what it's like as a coach and for the athletes that the league owns all the teams. And so literally exactly what you said. I said, we just, you just have folks on plane. I just have to focus on looking after you and that's it. And, uh, you know, there's, there's no disparity between any of the teams across the board. And that's pretty unique as far as the whole world goes for, for sport. And, uh, you're a big, big driver of that. And, and we thank you. So last question for me, snacks is just, uh, from one, from year one to three, if we think about, uh, Memphis and, and sweating and dragging garbage bags and scooters and, and, uh, tattoos, like, what are your thoughts from year one to year three? How do you describe that? And, and what could fans expect in the future for, for the Premier Sevens across the U.S.? Oh, wow. That's, that's, a, that's a big question and a great question, Robin. And um, I want to I want to address what you said about the equality piece. That is every decision, every task, equality and equity go into it, right? Is, is this available or accessible for all of our players, all of our coaches? And we work really hard. And, and at times it could seem like we're the fun police or it's a tedious task when we ask those things internally. But it's really important for us to get that right, you know, down to to making sure that we're in the same hotel. Everybody's there, you know, making sure the training facilities are the same for every single person. Kit allocation is, is you know, big things too, right? Even working on the sizes, right? So that's that's really important for us. So thank you for acknowledging that. Like that is a huge job and a huge task. And the team around me does it excellent job of, of putting that into play year one as we all know was a very uh it, w- it was a very interesting time in memphis right we were bookended by two very big challenges one, well, obviously we're in the covid pandemic you know we had the a hotel was not properly staffed well the athletes were all over the all over the lobby we had you know chipotle deliver for dinner there was a hole in the, the ceiling and it's leaking water danny barrett's yelling at me that he wants his room ready you know and and we adapted and we overcame, right? And then we got everybody to the rugby and everybody was playing and, and we had an amazing event in Memphis, you know, through through all the players and coaches and staff that we had. And then Southwest canceled 700 flights on Saturday night while we were all at the after party enjoying sort of like this first big thing. And uh, we worked for like 36 hours straight to get everybody home in a timely manner. And I woke up Monday morning and I was like, oh man, I can't believe the week we just had and i was talking to aaron cummings and he was like so when are we doing this again and i was like you want to do that again and he was like yeah yeah that was awesome let's let you know this is great there's something here you know so so for us 
taking that like two days after that melee of, of a first week and hearing Aaron Cummins and, and sort of where he stands in the community, you know, hearing Danny Barrett, you know, hearing I love Kelter and, you know, Kelly Griffin and all these people I look up to saying like, we need to do this again. was like, all right, just tell me when my contract starts, you know, and, and year two, we scaled up to three events and it was exciting. You know, there's some really champagne rugby that was played in, in all three venues, you know, culminating in Austin, which is easily one of the nicest venues I've ever played in. And now we're starting in Austin, you know, so that's, that's pretty epic. And then uh, year three, what can people expect? Entertainment, champagne rugby, pump and fan festival, you know, music acts from female artists and minority artists that we're trying to work with. We're an all encompassing package. You come to the rugby for five or six hours you know, you're going to be entertained with big hits, huge runs, you know, uh, beautiful colors and kit and, and you know, sound systems and pumping music and festival filled with, you know, like beer sponsors and hydration sponsors and all the things that we're putting together. And then you culminate that in your day with with the finals and, and everybody playing their hearts out to get the maximum amount of points possible to earn their way into the championship in, in round five. It's, a, it's exciting. Like, I get the chills thinking about that. I get to build this, right? Like, holy wow. Like, can't believe it. I'm the big prop kid who's holding the bag. You know, like, let's go. It's 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 all on you. Let's do it. And I think people are in for an exciting time. Or get a ticket, bring a friend, buy a hot dog, buy a beer, you know, say hi. Everybody's accessible at our events. You know, the athletes and coaches and even you, Dallin, are accessible. You're everywhere. You know, it's it's the American pathway in professional league that's developing and building something in the American sporting landscape that hasn't been done anywhere else, right, for rugby. You know, and, and we take pride in that. And every day we're looking at different opportunities. So from even now, if we're going to tell you here, and we're, you know, we're arriving in Austin very shortly, there's going to be some changes and some updates to even events three, four, and five that are being going to be excited and exciting and be announced and, you know, players are coming in and it's, it's wild. It's going to be a wild ride this summer. And I can't believe, you know, we're, we're going to be there very, very soon. Very soon indeed. And it is a roller coaster, as you said, from year one, it's as, it is amazing as Robin and you touched on, you know, the staff you have, the people you have, the creativity you have too, because it would be easy just to follow what's happened in the past and say, all right, let's mm-hmm. just do a world seven series kind of idea, but this is all very different. Even the fact that the final in Memphis went to a kick out was <laughs> thrilling and exciting for the fans as commentary yeah. crew. We were like, Oh no, we have to pull out our, our, those rules. We forgot about that. You know, it was that exciting. So you're right. Edge of your seat stuff, a lot to come snacksy. And I want to just finish off though, because we'll chat more, obviously get you on again. Yeah. Every time I see you though at the end of event and you've obviously, you know, you've, you've gone through five or six different uh, uh, shirts because it's so hot normally <laughs> and, and a million different things. You're hitting a drop goal, whether it's in the Rugby World Cup somewhere around the world or whether it's the PR7s, you're striking one drop goal from far out. So what is that tradition all about? That is a good question. And there's a, there's a group of us through USA Rugby and PR7s and the Gophers and, and Coast Guard Rugby that – we have a tradition, right? At every every stadium or event that we play, you know, we go out and we have a one kick challenge. You get one kick from one spot. And if you miss, you miss. If you make it, you get bragging rights. You know, uh, there's several of us, you know, Calder Cahill from USA Rugby, Brandy Medra and myself. You know, we, uh, we've we been keeping that alive. And you're right. We hit drop goals at, at every one. You know, I, my favorite one ever, I hit it hit a drop goal from inside the door at the Fullerton Cal state Fullerton stadium. When we played Chile against USA, like trick shot. And, and I hit it and I couldn't believe it. And they were like, you gotta be kidding me. Yeah. It's a lot. It's so much fun. Like, and I can't believe that they let us do that. You know, I get to go out on a stadium pitch and, you know, one, keep everybody away so we could do it. And then two, go ahead and have that fun. All right. Dallin, what were we talking about before? There was something I wanted to comment on. What was the question before that? Uh, yes, I was, saying, saying, uh, I, w- I was just saying how, uh, you know, the, the crew you've pulled together and, 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 and how everything is, is, is oh, uh, creative. World so World Series, slightly different. Like you've come up with some new things that like these elimination knockouts, yeah. these are very exciting. Yeah. 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 So I, I actually wanted to comment on that. Right. So that was part of the, the sort of instructions to me when I came on board was you've been on the men's. I, and actually, I forgot to mention, I was helped start the women's series in the United States in 2013. Right. So I've been on the men's series and the women's series for a very long time. And what was told to me in my instructions were 
you know the standard, you know what athletes and coaches will will rise to and what they, I'm going to say accept for lack of a better term, but what standards we need to keep, how would you change that? How would you make it more sustainable? How would you, you know, how would you keep from printing a whole tree's worth of, of paper? You know, how would you, you know, how would you keep athlete equality and comfort and experience at the forefront? You know, how would you do it differently? So that's also an important piece for us is, is that creativity of, of looking at the whole process and saying like, we could do this in a more efficient manner, maybe not better, but like what works for us works really well. I, myself and my staff can run the entire league from our phones electronically, whether it's the Google sheets that we use for broadcast or it's the Divi cards that, you know, for per diem for the players or the onboarding forms or, or even just the competition management system that we use, right? The communication, everything's from the phone, travel, everything. So we're light, we're fast. We've, we've sort of taken the lessons we learned on the world series. And, you know, I've even had an opportunity to, to install some of my staff in the world series. They were liaison officers this year and last year. And, you know, they've worked these events and they're starting to see what it looks like to take care of a high performance team and put those things into play. So that, that for us is exciting too, that creative creativity piece. So sorry, I forgot to comment on that, but you know, that's, no, that's no, it's, 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 it is important to mention, you know, our backgrounds are Sevens World yeah. Series backgrounds, but we know we're going to get more fans to watch Sevens, to take part and that sort of thing, because it is the most exciting sport there is, you know. Snacks, we want to, mm -hmm. you know, first, obviously, thank you for everything you've done for the game so far and a great thing still to come. We're going to see you this week in an awesome Texas. You're going to be starting drop goals there front and center so people can come for the rugby, then come for the music, then they can stay behind and watch that single shot. I mean, we're probably going to have to have a camera on you now that we've brought hyped this up. So you you probably have to get a lot of practicing done before we see you at Q2 Stadium. I think I'm going to need to warm up for that one. But, you know, I, I back myself. I'll hit it. I back yourself too. Snacks, your bloody star, your sleek <laughs> sensation, absolute legend. Thanks, guys. Appreciate you. He told me he will one day be president of the United States of America, but he certainly does talk a lot. Corey Jones puts in the hard work. He's played at more stadiums than you two. It's such a pleasure to welcome the sleek sensation, the USA Sevens Eagle, the Rocky Mountain expert in PR7 to the Rugby Sevens roller coaster. Hey, guys. Dallin, Robin, how you doing, guys? Oh, great to have you on, buddy. Uh, firstly, I like the facial hair you've got going on. Normally, it's just a big mop of hair when you're diving and scoring, but I like you added a bit on the front as well. We don't often speak to people that have been accepted to Ivy League sensations. So you went to Yale for a little while. Firstly, kick us off there. What did you study? What was your time like there? And and uh, tell us a bit about being on that campus. Yeah, no, Yale was cool. Um, I graduated from a state school in University of Arkansas. And then I'm going to Yale for a master's program. So I studied biology, ecology uh, to add on to my education degree. Uh, and then about halfway through, I ended up getting an opportunity to go play in Japan. So, I mean, I couldn't can skip up that opportunity. Uh, I can always go back to school and uh, learn a little bit more later. But I mean, the campus itself was, it's a, it's a campus inside the city. So that's pretty cool. And then, um, but outside of that, I mean, it's just a, it's just a regular university. I mean, probably some, some more like-minded people, people that are a little bit more focused on, you know, their academics, but I mean, you still got the athletes, you still got the party, you still got, you know, the, the same Muppets that you do in the other school. Well, I mean, that's the thing. You've, you, you've got the athletic ability, but you've got the brains as well. I can't say that for uh, your two co-hosts here. <laughs> Corey, that. Corey, tell us a little bit about how you got into the, into rugby and what other sports did you play growing up? Yeah, no, definitely. Um, oh, man, I got a, the long story, the short story for, for that one. Um, I was actually playing scholarship baseball for the University of Arkansas. Ended up not falling in love with baseball like I was from age four to age 18. Uh, and then ended up walking on to the football team at the University of Arkansas. So I was playing D1 football for a little bit. They shut down the program for a year. That time I had, uh, there were two South African coaches coaching rugby, club rugby at the University of Arkansas, Coach uh, Warren Fife and Coach Franz Schuppert. And those guys ended up coming to the, uh, the clubhouse or the field house uh, for the football team and said, hey, guys, before you transfer, if you want to play a sport that uh, actually came from football and that uh, you want to, you know, keep your skills ready, stay honed in, you know, for the next season. And since they were like, stay at the campus, try this out. Then when you get done, you can always come back to football. And I was like, yeah, sure. I don't like transferring. Like, I'll give it a shot. And tried it one time uh, that summer, ended up going back home underneath Julie McCoy. For y'all to know Julie McCoy, she's, you know, 
thousands of accolades, Eagle herself. Uh, she kind of taught me the basics and, you know, kind of made me fall in love with the game. And then she sent me right back to school uh, with a little bit more knowledge and I never left it. Wow, that's that's amazing. I, I love that question always because everybody has a different path to finding rugby. Most people in the U.S. don't grow up with rugby as a five-year-old and you found the sport accidentally. You excelled at it so much so. We're talking about last year, very recently, tournament MVP, Club 7s national champion yet again, NAV 7s. You won it all. Give our listeners a bit of background as to what is NAV 7s. It was only a recent program started. And uh, what did it take to be the best in the USA in the game of sevens? Yeah. Um, so I guess NAV 7s is National Athletic Village. It is a organization picked up and brought on by Robert Bortons and April Bortons. Uh, Robert's our director. April is our SNC uh, and our speed coach. She actually has a very deep background in um, that type of field, and she was a big track athlete back in Ohio State. So we're really, really fortunate to have uh, somebody like April uh, coaching us. And then Rob brought on JK and Emil, who, I mean, these are two professional coaches through PR7 itself. They're both expert coaches. Um, so I think just having a bit of time with them, this will be when I'm my fourth year with NAV. And probably my third year with the meal, fourth year with JK, having NAV and experts and NAV and experts. I've got a bit of chemistry. I'm able to kind of pick their minds and, you know, a brilliant mind like JK and Emil. Like if I can start to think and replicate the things that they're speaking on on the field before it's happening, I think we kind of got a, a leg up on the competition. And that's kind of how we ended up pulling out a, a championship win last summer. Yeah, it was it was so great to see, you know, um, as you said, that core group of players and coaching staff working together as well, which is brilliant. And I know from my days playing at Club 7s Nationals, it's it's such a tricky competition, like the PR7s, because you could be surprised by any side. You lose a game, you're out. But having you at the helm there wearing the number three jersey, carving it up, always a great side. Thanks, brother. Tell, tell us a bit about your NAV7s coaches who also teamed up, like you said, with the experts last year. And you guys went on a big run winning the first two tournaments. And how do you enjoy working with them? God, like I, I love working with J.K. and Emil. I think what sets them apart from other coaches that I've had is they are very player. They're, they're a very, very player centric team, and they kind of let the players dictate the, the the culture of it. The culture of it. So I guess you know you do have to pick some some good eggs in the basket to give your team that much trust. But um, I don't know. I, I feel like it's 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 really really worked. There's no parents on the team. There's nobody who's being authoritarian or who, you know, can't check their egos, but, you know, that's the same thing from us. So, I mean, when we get in day one, it's culture building. It is, it's bonding. It's honestly learning each guy. I feel like I'm, I'm giving another head coach now all the secrets, but uh, it, it's bonding and it's learning and it's just really growing together as soon as possible because at the end of the day, we're all picked as rugby players. And if we couldn't do the job, we wouldn't have been selected in the first place. So it's more just gaining trust and gaining connection uh, more than anything else. Because, you know, if I can trust to turn my back to go make a tackle, then the next guy's going to be right there. That's a step sooner than the guy who's not sure and hesitates. You know, the game's about inches. So, And just touching on that, obviously, the chemistry. But what's it like for you now in America to be paid to play rugby sevens, to be a full-time professional? Obviously, for a limited period of time, the two tournaments you're playing, and then when you guys do really well, you go to the finals. What is that like, you know, because when you started the game, none of that was around. Yeah, uh, it's actually really cool to now be a part of an organization to make me a professional athlete. To be honest, I've been very blessed and I've been playing professionally for the last eight years. Or rugby has been my full-time job for the last eight years with different organizations. It's probably why I've played with so many clubs. Um, They've been more than generous to, um, to keep me alive and keep me afloat. And I've been able to help a couple of clubs win some some pretty lucrative things. Yeah, I God, I, I really enjoy PR7s. I did the MLR for a little bit. I played in Japan for a little bit um, in the professional league over there. And PR7s, it, it's a really cool spot. It's a really cool spot. I enjoy that there's a women's side that's connected right onto it. They're treated as fairly as, as I feel like it could possibly could be from the veterans, from men and women, to the rookies for men and women. I mean, everybody gets their own shot. If they make that 12, they make that 13th man roster. Uh, it's the same kit. It's the same pay. It's the same food. It's the same housing. You know, everybody gets a bus on the same bus. We have to, you know, share a bus with the other team. So it's, it's I don't know, it's, it's a humbling, very 
professional experience that I'm, I'm so lucky to be a part of. And now, CJ, I want to ask you another question because whenever I get the commentators' bios, it's really cool. And some people fill out a lot, some people don't. You always, always has at any given time when you're on the field, you're the best cook there is. So I need to know the backstory because I say it, but I don't actually know the story behind it. Tell us more, Gordon Ramsay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, cooking has always been a really big passion of mine. Um, I've never been able to sit down long enough in one spot to. Um, really see this dream turn to fruition but um as lucrative as my rugby dreams are when i do retire i'm gonna go and study for my michelin star uh i have a really big passion for cooking i uh, started back in university i didn't really like the dorm food so you kind of had to sink or swim and just since then i've traveled to so many different places i have me a little notebook in the back um that i've just been jotting down different recipes different ingredients that taste good together from different cultures and different spots. And it's kind of built a, a pretty good repertoire together. I think the only person that would rival me on the field cooking would be Mickey Bateman, which he it's his first year into the league. So congrats to Mickey. We got you in the kitchen, brother. Well, listen, we'll, we'll come to yours on Friday before the tournament. So let us know what you're cooking up. We'll go to Bateman's on Saturday. So we got it all lined up. Done, done, done. <laughs> So let's dive off field. I got to say, I've had the opportunity to work with you, CJ, a few years ago, Rugby Town Sevens, probably one of the most flavorful guys off the field and on the field. Genuinely one of the best athletes I've ever met. Like we don't have any Corey Jones kicking around Canada, unfortunately. So hopefully your family migrates north one day, but uh, it was a pleasure working with you. But you're a very interesting guy, well-traveled and, and a lot of personality. What can you tell our fans and our listeners about CJ off the field, what activities do you like outside of cooking? And what are some fun facts? I don't know. I've, I've, I've tried to, I guess it's funny. I have um, took a bit of time after, I guess we'll jump right into it, the Black Lives Matter movement to kind of look at what's going on here in America. And then I, feel, I believe a, a year, two years later, the, um, the big movement with her body, her choice. And now with it being June, we're talking about the LGBTQ and how trans lives matter and, and the whole discrepancy is going on there. So I guess what people don't know about me is I did take a pretty big journey with myself to kind of get uh, mentally tougher. And um, I took a step away from uh, the social media outside of, you know, posting for the fans or posting for the sponsorships. Cause I do have sponsorships that do require me to keep up things like that. Um, but I started reading a lot more. That's probably a, a really big thing. I started reading Will Smith gave a quote that you got to be good at two things as a human, reading and running. And if I can get some time to break that down, I guess like reading, there's not a thing that anybody has ever gone through or will ever go through that hasn't been written down somewhere. And I heard that and kind of like thought about it and pondered that. And it, I mean, it seems, I mean, also the exception of your rule, but there's nothing that has happened in any sort of instance ever that hasn't been written down somewhere that somebody hasn't gone through in the, you know, millions of years that we've been on this earth and then got to get good at running because running is one of those things that, especially if you're not training for something, there's that, 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 that mental side of you that says like, okay, I've had enough. Let's stop. You know, I've ran too much. I'm tired. My legs are burning. My, my lungs hurt. Like let's stop. And then, you know, it's been proven 40% of what you're given is like where that mind starts to knock on that door. And you have 60% left in the tank. So, I mean, if you can push past that 40%, I mean, Ravi says it best, like, you think you may die, but you won't die. So, I mean, it's just like, if you can get really good at reading and really good at running, I think that would just end up being uh, a twofold to, to you being a better person and then a better movie player. Yeah, I love the social issues you're involved with. And um, PR7s will be highlighting more of those as the season gets on as well, because that's equally important. The rugby, yes, it's exciting and it's awesome. great. Um, but it's it's the off-field things that that really make a difference. And having yourself as a spokesperson for some of those, I, I think is wonderful. And that's kind of why we wanted to get you on here as well, because we know you're so, such a well-balanced person. And I think that's obviously vital. All right, my friend. So this weekend, we kick off the Eastern Conference in Austin, Texas, June 17, broadcast on CBS Sports Network. You have some predictions. You've seen some of the team sheets. You've played against some of these teams before. Some of them are newer. But on that Eastern side, which of the men's side do you think is going to come through top? So you've got the headliners, you've got the New York locals, the Texas team, and then the Pittsburgh Steel Toes. Oh, man. Um, I'm actually excited. 
funny enough, I'm actually excited to see the headliners play again. Hate to bring up bad blood, but they came up the bridesmaid uh, every tournament. Every single tournament, they took home a silver medal, whether it's, you know, for their own default or, you know, we'll blame it on the ref, the good old ref. But um, I would like to see I'd like to see them pull out a championship. I think it'd be good for the franchise. I think it'd be good for the players, because if not, I do see a Texas team making the comeback, looking at the roster, knowing Troy personally, the head coach of the Texas team. I mean, I, I got some friends. I got some teammates scattered in different places like the Steel Toes and the, the locals. But those are probably my top two picks of teams and organizations that I do know that I'm familiar with and I think will we'll go pretty far. I like it. And also this time around, different from last year's because of the conference setups as well. So it's a pretty fascinating one. So you, you never know. You may even never play with some of these sides because they won't make the finals, which will be interesting as well. And we'll see you at the Western Conference kickoff on June 24th in Minnesota. What are your thoughts on the op- opposition Rhinos, SoCal Loggerheads, the Golden State Retrievers, and my Northern Loonies? I am, I mean, obviously excited to play uh, back against the Loggerheads. That was my, my home club, Frankie Hoyne. Uh, that was my club for an entire year, uh, living at Rhinos. Uh, Andrea and Derek are doing a great job out there. Uh, they're in safe hands. And I mean, if you've seen the Looney or the Loggerheads roster, I mean, they, they have a blasted roster. So, um, I think, I think they'll farewell, uh, farewell any given, any given day. The Retrievers, I think that's a, a that's going to be a really fun team. Excited to see a lot of the poly boys out there. I heard a couple of guys got traded to, to stay on the West Coast. I think it's even more exciting. I like the fact that there are trades and there are moves being made behind scenes to, to make the organization or make the, the outcome a little more exciting. And then uh, the Loonies, uh, brother, I'm really excited to see what y'all have in store. Y'all came up short uh, last last year, if we'll call a spade a spade. That's not your brand of rugby. That's not something that, that, you, that you live towards, and that's not something you teach. So I'm really excited to see how you turn the, the Loonies organization around and, and the wins that are going to come from it. Hopefully not off the experts' backs, but still excited either way. Well, I'll be uh, I'll be with the women again on the on the women's side, but uh, we've got a, we've got a lot of Canadians and uh, and a special Alaskan making a making a comeback. But uh, yeah, the Loonies men got a few signings recently up their sleeve as well. Mm-hmm. But overall, I think it's going to be an exciting summer. And you know, you got teams like yours and and the headliners that have you know good chemistry of of and core of guys from last year. And then we got some new teams that are just rolling the dice as well. So from a planning aspect, from a coaching aspect, you don't really know, like, you know, you just got to stick to your own game plan, I think. What, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think that that has to be true. Um, I, I'm kind of on the, the the council side for the expert. So I know, like, even on our end, we have some some players that had to pull out last minute. I mean, you know, things happen, life happens. So you kind of have to roll with the punches. I feel like just like how NAV goes, if you set a good platform, and you give it to the guys and you trust the guys to do the job, it kind of makes the coaching job a little bit easier where you just have to focus on stuff and maybe a little generalized game plan. Well, CJ, we want to thank you for your time, pal. We can't wait to see you carve it up yet again for the experts. Coming on the roller coaster has been always always a dream to have on somebody that can dive 80 meters in the sky and score a champagne rugby try. The future chef, the future president. You're the man. Cheers, guys. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Kia ora and Talofa Ruby, what a pleasure to have you on the Rugby Sevens roller coaster. And while it took us a while to lock you in, several months, we all know why, because you got more steps in the Great Wall of China. <laughs> What's up, Dylan? Hello, Robin, and everybody on the roller coaster audience. Uh, yeah, what a ride. Happy to have finally made it and um, been working with Dylan since Hong Kong, so it's cool to uh, finally link up. Yeah, so great. And we want to welcome you to the US. We know you recently arrived in Austin. You're still recovering from the jet lag. So, you know, if our questions do put you to sleep, it's not our questions. <laughs> it actually is the travel. Yeah, I'm, I have, if you see me just, I'm desperately trying to yeah. hone in the coffee, eh? Like, wake up, exactly, bro. But we got this. Exactly. So we'll start off, you know, how are you feeling about this exciting new adventure? Yeah, look, honestly, I'm so super excited. Um, you know, it, Typical, I managed to get to go on the first ever sabbatical, you know, f- uh, for professional women in, in our country. So I was like, man, I'll, I'll better go somewhere cool and, and do it proper. And um, look, to be honest, there's quite a few, um, 
you know, opportunities out there now for women around the globe, which isn't a bad thing really. Um, but I've been watching the PRC for a while, mm. heard about the chat um, for a few years actually. You know, there was all this chat like, oh, it's going to be equal um, men's and women's teams, it's going to be equal amount of games, it's going to be equal amount of prize money. And I honestly didn't know if that was true, if it was actually going to come into fruition. And lo and behold, here we are. So this is the third year now. PR7s is growing um, very nicely. I met the whole team, um, everybody behind the scenes in this trip. And so here I am in Austin, hopefully going to get involved this weekend. But, yeah, it's 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 pretty incredible that it's actually happening and it's actually a huge privilege to be here. Yeah, it is. And for us, it's a huge coup to get you over to, to North America and playing in the competition. We had Stacey Walker on the episode last time, and it's just awesome to have these international players that we've seen around the world. Obviously, you and I have connected in the Sevens World Series, but to have you here physically playing, stepping a few people, obviously not too many loonies because Robin, as a coach, would not want that. But I, but I want to touch on the broadcasting side of things because you said we met in Hong Kong. It's obviously the most famous event there is. The woman played for the first time there as well, which was remarkable to see. What was it like for you being in the broadcast booth? Because at times it looked like you were going to pull the headset off and jump into the field and, and play it <laughs> for a few tries. <laughs> yeah, the, the commentary booth at Hong Kong is really cool. Like, best seats in the house, you know, like usually the commentary is ages away, you can't really see much, but it was right there and there's actually no window. So physically probably could have jumped out and not going to lie, crossed my mind a couple of times, you know, um, but it was so cool to see the Kiwis get up, you know, for the Black Food Sevens to win the first ever one. Like, oh, you know, inaugural champs is special because you're forever going to be the first ever champ. So oh, it was just a privilege to be there. And I've got to say, Dylan, you're actually really wonderful to commentate with. You you um you make it really easy for the for the second caller. So um yeah, that was, that was really cool to commentate with you too, man. Oh, Rubes, we had a wonderful time and it, it is re really cool because often when new new players come in, they're obviously done unbelievable things in the field. But as you found out, broadcasting is completely different. You are natural though. So that's why I think it was so easy for you to slot in because you bring the energy, you bring the vibe, you know the game so well, you know the players. But I was just cracking up because the things, I've never seen anything like this. Robin, <laughs> you weren't there in the booth and we should have, uh, Dave Wilroby did film it. So there I'm standing next to Ruby calling a couple of games and the game is so tense. She picks up a chair, lifts it above her head and puts it on her head. I I'm, I don't know even know what's going on. The game is thrilling enough, but I'm more entertained here by Ruby going berserk on the side. It was something to behold. <laughs> and that's why we call it a roller coaster. Tell me you tackled Dallin at least. <laughs> a couple of hits in the booth. Uh, not quite, because I actually needed him. He was, he, was, he was on my team in the commentary booth. <laughs> but I'm, I'm quite a... Yeah, commentary, I didn't know if I could do it, because when I watch particularly rugby, like 7s or 15s, or netball, because I grew up playing netball, I like... I don't know if anyone out there does it too or you guys do it, but, you, you, you know, like, especially when I'm watching, I've done a lot of visualisation over the years and I, you know, like, I've, I've done it in bed before, like, I'm you know, thinking about the game and then, you know, I tackle someone and then my whole body, like, flinches. So commentating, I've got to try and call it. Like, when I'm at home in front of the TV, I can, like, twitch and I can jump up. But commentating, I've got to try and rein it in a bit. And, yeah, commentating in the World Series, I lost it a little bit. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> so good. It uh, it doesn't go away. I know, like even probably a decade after my World Series career was over, I was watching watching Canada play. Of course, it's in the middle of the night, and my uncle was visiting from across Canada, and I, I woke up screaming at four in the morning. <laughs> I was lying in bed with my iPad. He comes running into my room. Are you okay? I'm like, I'm okay, but Canada's not okay. They're losing again, oh, or or they're winning or scoring. But uh, yeah, it doesn't go away. I mean, I've dabbled into commentating a bit over the last year, and Dallin's like like a dad or like a coach has been setting me up for success. So I know what to do, but just like anything, it's all about being prepared. But you know what I what I enjoyed about listening to you in Hong Kong is I don't know if Dallin's rubbing off, but you got some you got some nice one liners yourself. And uh, <laughs> is it true that you'll both be in the booth this weekend in Austin screaming at these players? Yeah, I think it was meant to be a bit of a surprise, like including for myself. But yeah, I think um, I'm going to be lucky enough to. Uh, Cut up with Dallin again, hopefully this weekend in Austin, which commentating is so cool because you literally get to watch every single game. You learn every like everything about the players, you know, so it's, it's I reckon it's a bit of an honour as well to um, not just watch, but get on behind the mic. And I think, um, I don't know where the one line is coming from, Dallin, you might be able to ask, but it's sometimes you just can't help it. Eh? Like, I feel like the players just set, set it up and you can't not say it. 
How do you feel about them? Yeah, well, Rips, what I'll say is it, it can either come naturally, which it does to you as well because you've got the great shreds, and, and I also, also like to use a few, uh, a few one here and there. Some of them I think are, are way ahead of time, but that's only like one or two. If I know like a player's playing and their name could rhyme with something, but you had some classics come out there and it was a joy because, again, sevens is exciting. It's fun. The audience wants it. You don't just want people saying, oh, and another try score by 2E there, she's in again. You've got to, you've got to bring it to life because the game is so exciting. Yeah, absolutely. And there were, you know, little moments where I thought, oh, this might not be that big of a deal, but I know what it's like out there. So I'm going to, you know, make make a moment of it. And boy, the feedback was great. Hey, eh? like, I've, I guess I've never um, commentated. Uh, well, I have, I did ages ago for Ken Laban years ago, but I guess it was the first time, you know, we had really quite instant feedback and everybody especially um from the motherland Samoa they were like you know that was my boy's debut or you know that really meant heaps when you said that and I was like oh wow like it's it actually is a really important role you know for these people yeah and, and particularly because of your cultural heritage and stuff like that you're able to speak languages that we can't right so your background so you sure I can drop a cause or a Afrikaans word here and there and so the fact that you you, you had Samoan at the ready to go and obviously you know be, being a, a Kiwi as well it was awesome I think that's very special for the audience watching it, it was a cool team, eh? The World Series team, like we're from all over the world. So, like, um, Robin, you know, when I couldn't say the Afrikaan name or something, Dallin would step in and vice versa of Samoan. Like, it was, it felt like a really cool team. Which represents the World Series. That's the best part is just the cultural diversity and the big party and everybody connecting and intermingling. So, what do you like most about being in the commentary booth and, and sharing those stories? Yeah, well, first and foremost, I'd say if you think, you know, if you've wanted to try commentating, um, you reckon you're, you're not from New Zealand or Australia, I reckon you actually probably have a strength, like you'll bring something different, a different kind of flavour to the commentary box. So um, I'm always encouraging people from different countries, um, you know, all the genders to come have a jam because it's um it's really, really cool. And I think people who might be a bit fuckamal, um, uh, what's the word? It's kind of like embarrassed, but it just means you keep it low. Um don't be like come have a jam, um, share your point of view. It's it's a really really cool part of the game. What's my favourite? But geez, I don't know. I love that. I love that you you follow the series around. Like we in Hong Kong and Singapore, we were just with the players. So like a couple of the French names. I just went up to the French boys at the pool when I was in my recovery. I was like, hey, excuse me, uh, moi français n'est pas bon. Can you just tell me how to say your name, boys? Like, so it's um quite close relationships with everybody. The players the world rugby staff the commentary um yeah it's, it's i don't know as a player it was a really cool concept everybody's linked um everybody works really closely with each other and i remember in the pool being like man when i'm a player i don't know half of these people but now i do like everybody here is part of the sevens like there's the cameramen there's the commentators they're like they're just everywhere so it was um a really cool change of perspective yeah, and I know there's going to be more opportunities for us to team up together, which is so great. And and the cool thing, too, is that the series keeps going. The Olympics come around every now and again. There are World Cups. I mean, they're just so so many pinnacle events. Now, when we did speak in Hong Kong, uh, you said to me you'd rather goggle wasps than be on another podcast, which I understand because you did so many in the past. Um, so thanks for being here, first of all. But I, wanted, I didn't want to delve into your childhood too much or anything like that. But I do want to ask you to share with our audience a bit about, you know, your cultural heritage, your background, things like that, which also make you such an asset on the World Series. Yeah, um, I guess just first on the podcast, it's um, I took so I, I went on a six month sabbatical straight away off the bat. I had a break um, after World Cup, and I was actually not contracted, so I thought I'd get a bit of a break. But what happened was I just ended up being able to say yes to um, all these things I've always wanted to try, um, which included probably about. 50 podcasts too many <laughs> um it's it's cool when the podcasts are different though and have niche audiences which i think this one does um but i think part of that was my fault i kind of went in hot and heavy I, I love connecting with people i love sharing everything and so i remember after like you know the 20th one you're like oh that, that's quite heavy so now I'm, i've had a bit of a break i'm back involved in rugby again which i'm so like you obviously need a break in your career but it's just made me I just want to play so bad now, you know. So, um, yeah, I'm grateful to be on this podcast. It's a it's a different feeling again, which is cool. Um, childhood, yeah. Look, didn't really, didn't really want to write a book, bro. It's it's quite a lot. It's quite heavy. Uh, but I I did definitely want everybody to share the cope up or the the understanding of everybody has a story. Like you, you just don't know what 
a, a person has been through. And when it comes to bloody trauma or um, battles or challenges you've gone through, there's no, to me, there's no room or there's just no space in that arena for comparison. I don't think we should be comparing um, how hard my challenge was compared to your challenge. I think the point of it is we've all gone through something and, you know, there's um, this concept of mana in the Māori community, or va, which is, it's, it's difficult to explain. You probably could have a whole episode on what mana is, but part of that concept is, you know, even us three here in this podcast room, each of us have gone through very different but equally challenging experiences in our lives just to be here in this room together, right? So when we enter this Zoom or this this room, we pass through those internet doors and we sit down and we all have something to be proud of that we've gone through to get here, to be the people we are right now sitting in this in these chairs. And each of us bring a whole bunch of different experience or different strengths into this room. And I and I I wanted people to understand that concept because you know I play a team sport. And you've got superstars. You've got people who score 118 tries a tournament. And that is amazing. That's out the gate. But a team means you need everybody's money in that team to get, you know, to get those wins or to get those results. And so, I mean, there were so many reasons. I, I, I guess you flinch away from writing a book. But the positive effect, I guess, that I could have was – bigger than myself, bigger than my embarrassment or those challenges or those hard combos that I went through with my people to hopefully get across what I love so much about sport and about sevens in particular, which is you need everybody. You need everybody in your team. You need everybody in this world. You need everybody in the world rugby um, team, you know, to, to make something truly great happen. So, yeah, I mean, it was difficult. Those conversations were hard, but I, I think it was worth it. I think it was good. No, it's it's great, and and a big a big background for me is just you know is just trying to motivate, find talent, and develop it. And a lot of times, you know, young people they see people on TV, they see you, for example, scoring tries, and they think like, oh, they just see like the tip of the iceberg, right? Mm-hmm. They see those fourteen minutes, or they see you lifting that trophy, and you're like, she was just born a rock star. I could never be yeah. like, I could never be like Ruby. You know, that's that's kind of the nice thing about the podcast or the book. So these kids can understand, like, actually, what does it take? It takes the whole village, but it also takes everything. And um, and I think those kind of stories by people that are current and relevant and, and a pioneer for the sport on a global scale as one of the top players in the world, uh, that's so selfless. You're such a great ambassador of the sport. And and again, we're, we're thrilled to have you in North America and uh, looking forward to you, uh, you know, finishing the top two in the West. <laughs> I like what you did there. I like what you did there. <laughs> and 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 Rube, so I ordered the last copy on Amazon of your book straight up. So it's coming soon, which is great. I'll get you to sign it if you don't mind. Uh, so you've got to re- you got to you got to restock the shelves because North American market's going to want to read your story <laughs> if they haven't already. Now I want to touch on a couple of things. You're from the most successful rugby playing nation on the globe. Although the population is only about five million in New Zealand, now crazy to think where you are sitting right now in the great state of Texas, they have six times more people than New Zealand just in Texas alone. All right, so tell us how did you get into rugby and a bit about that campaign I read, the Go For Gold campaign. Yeah, well, um, you know, I guess I just think rugby is growing so fast and it's so exciting. And I, I always say to people, because I used to play netball, growing up netball was the main sport for young girls in New Zealand. And if you've ever been, like, frustrated in your sport, like, physically frustrated, like, oh, man, like, you know, she was pushing me or, oh, I didn't get this call or, or you're just like, oh, like, you feel like that, come and try rugby because it's it's all about the honesty of the contact. Like, there's no, like, oh, you know, I, I swear I touched that or I swear I didn't do this. It's like you either tackled them or you didn't, you know, and it's um it's I, I find it one of the most honest sports. Your pass has got to be crisp. Your tackle's got to be honest. Um, you know, and you've got to sometimes you've got to break and sprint the whole bloody field. You know, so it's it's just one of the most super skilled but honest sports that I've, I've ever tried. Um, well, you touched on the book. I I kind of talk about why I love it, and I just think, yeah, this you can say, oh yeah, I'm a good tackler, but there's nothing like just playing the game. You know, it doesn't have to be on TV, but just give it a crack. And some people like who who are a little bit standoffish are like the best tacklers. They eh? like they're just so so good. Um, so yeah, I was frustrated at netball. I feel like it's a non-contact sport, but all you do is just trying to contact without the ref seeing. 
and then I played at that all high school. I played everything in primary school, like dabbled in a little bit of rugby, but it was it just was never an option for girls. There was no way you'd get 15 on 15 um, females. Then I uh, went to uni and moved to the big city. I grew up in a small town, so I moved to the big city, and for the first time I saw 15 versus 15, like women's rugby. I'd never seen women's rugby in my life, and I was like, whoa. And then Go For Gold happened, geez, when was that, 2012. And just said, come down. And I, the game changer for the Gulf of Gold was that for the first time ever, there were going to be contracts. There were going to be 14 paid contracts for female seven players. And that was just like unheard of. Like, if you want to play women's rugby, you had to fundraise, you know, to, to play. And the sevens I was playing, which my first coach was actually Mary Baker, who's coaching me for the Golden State Retrievers, which is just buzzing me out. Um, you know, we had to fundraise. So we had to. She was always on us, you know. She worked at Minor 10, so I had to do the bloody sausage chisel outside Minor 10 and all the rest of it to fundraise to go travel and play sevens. And so the fact we could have paid contracts, I feel like, was just such a huge moment because all these wahine to all these strong women who had done it for so many years, like we could change the game for them kind of thing. Mm. Um, so, yeah, played sevens and it just changed my life. Talk about it in the book. The I will say in the book, though, it's um, probably the first few chapters – well, maybe like the bit R rated, like maybe if you're yeah. under 16, like yeah. maybe have a parent with you to, to go through those things. I, I talk about kind of extreme uh, mental health um, topics and just struggles. I, I um, you know, was in circles with drugs and, and stuff like that. So it was rugby and sport kind of gave me this, like, oh, what about this option? Like, where could this take me as opposed to like, oh, I kind of saw pretty clearly where that option, you know, took me. But but what about the sport option? And then, yeah, came through, go for gold, all the rest of it. And then I just kept following the path, kept working hard. And I woke up one day, bro, and I was at the Olympics. And I was like, holy heck, like, imagine if I did this from when I first started the drugs. Like, <laughs> I'd be way better. Like, <laughs> so, like, um, yeah, it was a, it was a, um, it was a massive... You, you want to say luck, eh? But it, there's no such thing. It's just no. that you're meant to be there. Yeah, where you meant to be. And went to one Olympics, got silver, went to the next Olympics with almost of a very similar team, similar teammates, um, got the gold. And so it just, yeah, it was just life-changing, really. And it's an unbelievable journey, as you said, from 2012 where that campaign came out and you achieved the gold in 2020, mm. uh, you know, so, or 2021, it, 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 absolutely remarkable as well, you know. They, love they, said go for, yeah. they said go for gold, but they should have put go for gold. <laughs> they never said it would take eight years. But just... Exactly. <laughs> well, it's been a, it's an amazing run for that group of women. Like you guys, you guys are still performing. It's insane. Just the standard. It's like, well, you could retire, but you're still all the best in the world. It's it's unbelievable. <laughs> Keep playing as long as you can. Uh, but you, okay. you know what I love about that is just having that carrot. You know, you got to be chasing a carrot and you got that carrot uh, in that go for gold campaign. And um, I was I was traveling around Canada doing talent that eat for the PR sevens. And I went to cut up with one of my old buddies that lives in Quebec on Eastern Canada. And I met his son for the first time. And the kid just kept coming upstairs with with, with a painting. He was downstairs painting. And I love this kid because I was just like him. I was just a crazy little kid. And it was a carrot. So then he come back upstairs with another carrot, with another carrot, another carrot. And I was just talking about how I'm always chasing something. I always have a carrot. And anyway, it's on my fridge now. And I, I took a picture of this. Kid. I said, well, what do you like? To, I said, do you like to paint? He says, I love to paint. What do you like to paint? I like to paint carrots. I'm like, oh, yeah, he's giving me 14 carrots. But <laughs> I always tell kids, you got to be chasing something. If you're not chasing something, then, then you know, somebody's chasing you. So uh, that's that's wonderful. And you've had a remarkable career, obviously winning a gold medal, silver medal, plus 15s and 7s World Cup championships and 15s, like at home. I mean, what a, what an inspiring story. What a journey. And, uh, and the best part about it is, you know, your Black Ferns, 7s and 15s women are so selfless, so humble. And uh, again, such great ambassadors of the game. Can you just share a little bit about that, those experiences and how you get up and go again? Yeah, I mean, I love your co-pop of the carrot. I um, I guess mine's kind of changed over the years and I'm, you're always growing, but I think now I'm like, I can't... I can't dedicate myself, my life and my time to something if I don't absolutely believe in it, like wholeheartedly. And it's I, I think it's got to align with um, values and, and, and who you are. And I, I said to my, I can't remember who it was, uh, maybe Shred Kaka, who you should get on, she's funny. 
not too funny not funny than me right um but she's funny she's funny i follow on social media she's good good. i'm working i'm working on making her a loony right now actually yeah Yeah, oh yeah no she loves dogs so i think golden state hey ray but i was saying oh i actually don't know if i would have you know um done a decade of sevens if it wasn't this whole you know fight for equal pay because we it's it's equal you know resources in new zealand for sevens like it's it's amazing and um there was this whole journey and um it really meant so much to me. Like I really felt like, because because you think about footy, you guys can relate to this. You you've got to say, it's, I don't like to say sacrifice, but you choose to say to your family, I can't come to that. I'm going to rugby, or I can't come to this wedding. I'm going to. I can't come to this, and it's it is. Re- I really struggle with that. Like I, I find it really hard because we say, oh, this is for our family, but then I can't go to this. Like it's it's a real play. So I'm at a space where I'm like, if I'm gonna say used to rugby and know to the people I love, it has to be for a good reason. Like it, it has to be for something that I totally believe in. And um, getting equal resources in sevens was, I was like, yeah, this is, you know, this is a good cause. Um, that That's why, you know, there were there were other opportunities out there, but I'm coming to PR sevens because I want the world to see you can do it. You can set up a competition with women and men, equal prize, but it's like, it's like there's, it's just so solution focused to me. I, I just want the world to see it's easy, man. Like you can totally do it. And when the 15s happened, it, it was a massive decision for me. Like, I, you know, I had to leave sevens, and, and sevens had blessed me so much. So it was it was a massive decision, but I don't know if you guys saw, but the, the year before um, the Rugby World Cup year, the Black Ferns had these massive losses. Like, like, we're, like yeah. we'd never seen anything like it. And, and, and everybody, all the women's rugby world kind of went like, hey, like, like what, that's... You know, something's going on here. And so, you know, I sat there and I was like, come on, Rose, like, what, you know, it's going to be a massive year. What are you, what are you doing? How are you going to spend your time? And I, and at the end of the day, I was like, oh, it's, it's not a hard decision at all. The, the 15s are kind of going through what sevens went through, you know, they're going pro, which sounds like it's just great, but it's actually really difficult to learn. In, in New Zealand, the, the boys went through it at 95, 96, they went professional and, it's great, you know, you become, you do what you love and get paid for it, but there's all these little difficulties and learnings that you just don't see coming. And so I really wanted to um, jump over there and just offer what I could. I honestly, if I didn't make the World Cup team, I wouldn't have been mad, but I would have been able to look myself in the eye and been like, nah, I, you know, I gave my heart and my soul and I said no to my family. I said yes to this team because I feel like I could have offered them something. And so, oh, it ended up being the bloody best thing in the whole world, didn't it? Like, I Honestly, we all, you know, some days we're like, are we crazy, bro? Like, are we really going to do that? I was like, no, we can do this, we can do this, we can do this. So um, it just turned into the, the most wild ride, one of the coolest, craziest, hardest, best years of rugby in my whole career. You know, I don't, you probably heard, but our the head coach had to leave. So six months out from our home World Cup, we got no coach. And Smithy Crono and Sir Ted come in, which it's, it's great, but... You know, the, the reality is the demograph was, um, okay, this is a bit of an exaggeration, but there's three 70-year-old white guys come in to coach a predominantly brown group of young females, never have before. Like, you know, there's there's lots of things in there. And then um, we just, every day, we were just like, Kennedy Simon, our captain, came up with it. We are like, what we're doing is crazy, and it's like never before. So every day we're just like, Whew, that is like never before. And then every day, you know, we just went through with that cover and holy heck, uh, you saw the semi final. That what the heck kind of ended? We're just like, oh, like never before. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so we just kept on. And then in the final, you know, played England and they, you got to give it to them. They were the best team in yeah. the world at the time, undefeated for three years. And we kind of had to be a little bit crazy to think we could win, and we did, and then we won. And it was just the greatest. And I, you could write a whole bloody book about that year alone, I'm telling you, right? So, no, nah, no regrets. And I think if you – everyone's different, but for me, if I'm like – I look myself in the mirror, I'm like, this is the right thing. Like, you're you're doing the right thing. You're making me a better place. You know, I'll, I'll just keep going. Um, it's, it's those decisions that you're like, oh, no, like – 
am I being true to myself kind of thing that, that kind of steers you wrong or you've got no good carrot, your carrot's gone bad or something. So, yeah, it was a, it was a great time. I hope you boys watched the final. Ooh, oh, yeah, we did. There was, there was no better advert for the game. And and for young girls watching, seeing you all carve it up at home, record crowd, an unbelievable finish. But I also want to touch on the fact after the whistle, you were giving your medals for winning it, gold, everything. I believe you gave your medal away to your young girl in the crowd. Do you mind telling us that story? Because that was, was so touching. It's so funny, eh? Like, so I don't, it's great. Like, the profile's great. But yes, you, you can't do anything these days, eh? Like, <laughs> without the media, eh, hey, finding out. But I tried to do it real sneaky because that young kid, I actually, she just texted me before. It's her dad's birthday, Husty. Shout out to Husty. Yeah, she just was a really cool kid. And uh, we met her at a, at a signing that we'd had as a team. And she'd, um, don't want to sound soppy or anything. I'm sure she wouldn't want to either. But you know, she just survived leukemia, and her whole family had kind of gone through this whole thing. And I was just like, wow, like just her attitude towards life's really positive. She's got so much energy, and yeah, she was the last person I saw walking out of Eden Park. And you know, all the lights are off. She was still there and still smiling her face. And I just feel like it was just a bit of a lesson, you know, in, in life t times get really, really tough, but they, it could actually be a lot worse. And it um, just kind of reminded me, you know, my kind of life journey, it's, uh, it, it does get hard and, and it's not just on the field, eh? Like there's, there's so many things off the field. Life just gets tough. Um, but, you know, like you said, Robin, if you've got a good carrot out there and you're doing good stuff, like it's, it's worth carrying on. And so I just, felt it in the moment there's there was no other way i felt that i could sh show her or honor that moment and, and you know she's teaching me as well like it's just the medal really the the lesson you get and the life you get to live is more important than any materialistic thing so i just wanted her to have something to almost it was not the same but to almost equal what what she kind of um gave me in that lesson so yeah shout out to lucia she's she still got it uh, and they probably gave me another one, so I didn't know that was going yeah, to happen. Yeah, well, look, there we go. See, I mean, and also the thing is, you've re you've done it, you've achieved it, right? So, as you said, the medal is the medal. You you, know, you might see it at home at some point, but you've got you have so many medals, you know. So uh, <laughs> uh, it, it, it's it's better having you know her having it, and I think that's so special, so so great. So Ruby, um, quickly moving on, we want to talk obviously again promoting the women's game. You've done an unbelievable job, an important voice out there, um, and we obviously speaking about the Premier Rugby Seven this season. So, what excites you about joining the league on and off the field? And obviously, you're playing with you're playing with a teammate of yours and, and a handful of players you probably played against for the USA, Canada, things like that. Yeah, I think it's awesome, especially this year. Like our team alone, you know, there's we got Tongans, Americans, Canadians. Um, there's Rafa from Brazil, um, and then I got Shak Shakira Baker is one of my you know closest friends from the rugby world. We debuted together. Um, go for gold together. I think she's um, she's solid lass, like one person you do not want to get tackled by or run over. And I remember at the go for gold, like I'll never forget it, which was years ago, right? She was, um, you know, her speed time. She was at the, one of the top two speed times. And I was like, oh, no, that's like you're just asking to go to hospital, you know. Um, so I got her on my team, which is awesome. Um, Kaylin's from, from New Zealand. So there's just such a huge mix of people throughout the whole competition. And this year, you know, um, there's an Eastern and a Western Conference. It's gone from four to eight teams, so it's, the growth is undeniable. Um, it's on TV too here in America, I believe. Um, and, you know, I've always wanted like an NBA team to align with, and I'm playing for Golden State, baby. So on the Western Conference, West Coast, West Coast, um, representing Golden State, which has San Fran, which has a lot of um, Pacific in the community, Pacifica people, which I really wanted to um, represent, hopefully do proud. Um, and we'll get up to San Jose for a bit as well, hopefully see the community. So, yeah, I think it's just such a great opportunity. I think it's a cool amount of time. It's two months. You can dedicate to two to three tournaments. And it's kind of like a World Series, but around the States. So I'm in, I'm in Texas now to commentate. Then we're going to Minneapolis. Uh, Minneapolis. Minneapolis, yeah, yes, exactly. Robert can't say it either, so don't worry, you're in good hands. Uh, these, <laughs> some of these place names are getting me. Um, San Jose, um, and then the um, finals are in Washington, D.C. Like, how cool, you know? So it's it's such a cool opportunity. You ever wanted to live in the States for a bit, travel around and play the best players, not just from, 
USA or Canada, North America, but the whole world. Um, and I think it's only going to get bigger. It's only going to get cooler. I think more people are going to come. So you want to come jump on this now. Well, Ruby, we're looking forward to seeing you next week in a few days, I guess, after your weekend in Minnesota. I don't even say Minneapolis because I'll I will I will muddle it up. Like Dallin <laughs> helps me with some of our questions, and I gotta I gotta make it smaller. But wait till you get to Canada. Then you got some really exciting names to learn, like Saskatchewan and Saskatoon. Try not to get those mixed up. Oh wow! Uh, but uh, you've got a couple epic coaches and Mary and Kelly, which is super exciting. And and obviously the Golden State Retrievers, you'll be playing my loonies next week. So don't play too, too well. But what are your thoughts and what are your expectations of the level of competition in North America? It's um, I, I just think you guys are doing all the right things. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, you know, we, we had go for gold in New Zealand. We had nothing like this. Um, I think this is excellent. And the reality is the World Series is very equal you know like it's you're playing against the men's you've got to have dual tournaments on it all all time so it's actually replicating the highest level including the olympics and yeah the, the teams are really cool looney's got a lot of Can- um, canadians and then you've got kelta you've got the rugby academy rhinos like, there's a big um range in how you guys are growing the game as well which is represented in the teams which i think is awesome uh Mary baker hilarious like oh how the heck did she get a job here because she's she was my first ever coach in New Zealand, and she's she's known to be very um, also euphemism like it used like you know very just upfront and honest and but she made great players. But I was cracking up when I seen her here. She's related to Shakira Baker, who's my teammate, one of my closest friends. So it's, it's really really like full circle as moment for me. And then Griff, uh, Kelly Griffin, she was the captain of the USA when I first started playing. So when I in my first Olympics in Rio, and I don't know if people overlook the quarters, but we nearly lost the quarters to the USA and Griff was the captain. We won by like a couple of points or something. It was like Jill Potter, Nana Vasi, you know, like really stacked team and they definitely could have gone all the way and they nearly knocked us out. So I never thought I'd see Griff again, eh? but he's, now she's my coach. <laughs> Um, but the cool thing about um, player coaches is, you know, they kind of get it. They get how important team culture is um, and all the rest of it. And like I said earlier, I've, I've got to feel like we're making the world a better place for me to dedicate everything to. So Kelly um, gets that. Mary Baker, she's a Kiwi girl. And I know she'll be honest, she'll probably have us running around way too much. Please go easy, Baker. So, yeah, it's I'm really excited to represent the Golden State, which is Pacific Kiwi. I know there's, um, you know, people go through tough times here as well. They, they probably look to sport in particular rugby for something positive um so that means heaps and i don't know if you guys picked up on it but golden state retrievers is the only pun okay look we're already the funniest team um so i'm very very happy about it you will have to yeah we'll get some one liners ready get it ready to it's pretty it's, it's pretty easy when that name came out you know all right, Ruby. So we only have a couple of questions to go, uh, and then you can get back to resting and, and catching up on your sleep now. So I want to switch gears. Is there a fact or anything interesting that people don't know about you? Um, geez, I don't know. Oh, I just got a tat. There we go. I don't know if oh, this we is even, even get a preview. Wow. Look, oh, yes, I did see. So, tell yeah, us what so that means. Yes, what is it? This bit is done with a gun, like a normal. Uh, what do you call them? I don't know, tattoo gun, and it's got um all the designs of my family's traditional one in it. So it's just like a whole big, like my cousin's mother was there. Just a, it's a whole big dedication to my family, my granddad in particular. But this what this bit, see this bit up the top? Yes. This line around there. Yeah. <clears throat> bro, bro, Sorry. bro. Like getting a tattoo is sore, hundred percent. But that was with the traditional O, oh, bro. I like when you're a kid, you always cry from pain, and I have not cried from pain since I was a kid, and I was this close. Like when he was on the inner thigh, bro, and because it, it's it's like a it's like a um, stick with with like a sword, like you know, a big serrated knife on it, and it's like poof, and then they got to rip it out of his hand, and then poof, like it, I was like, I just didn't expect that to, have, to be like that um very proud i got it done because it's part of my tradition but yeah oh, I, honestly bro if you see somebody with the malu or the better like the traditional one all over their yes. body respect like respect oh that's amazing that's why robin's tattoo is this big it's a size <laughs> of it <laughs> 
So he Rivs, he actually has the Looney tattoo, the logo, because he made a promise to the team in the inaugural championship in Memphis, Tennessee. They played in the final and he told his team, all right. And Kelly Griffin was coaching with him. They were both coaches. If we win, we'll both get tattoos. And she's like, we will. And they won. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love that. Me and um, me and um, Gossie go at the at Rio. We go, if we win gold, we'll go get the rings together. Bro, we didn't win gold. It was really awkward. And then we're like, I can't get the rings. And then we designed one, like kind of the same, like because we went, we designed one. And then I think seven of us from the New Zealand team went out and got tattoos. It's it's like fun. It's like a good idea at the time, eh, bro? And then you're like, oh, that's, that's on there forever, eh? Hey? Like, <laughs> well, for me, it was my only tattoo I've ever got. And, um, but uh, it kind of like from obviously, I, I've been involved in a lot of a lot of women's. I coach men and women, but being in the inaugural uh, professional sporting event for uh, for for women uh, championship was a huge deal for me because I've been an advocate of the game, working with Canada and and U.S. and Mexico and, and Trinidad and Tobago for women. So and having young nieces on that was a big deal, and and obviously Looney representing kind of Canada, it, it meant a lot to me. And doing it with Griff and a big tie-in for Griff and I uh, is is Sluggo, the former USA and former Canada coach. So we were both coached by him, and he had a tattoo uh, that was kind of goofy in the same location. So it was like full oh, circle great. us finally working together, but. Um, just to wrap up from my side, it's just uh, what are your thoughts on the format? Semi-final, then final. So, like, intensity, seven, seven subs, but basically two games to win the championship in each stop this year. Um, like I said, it's it's already kind of popped off and grown, right? Like, it was, um, I think, one stop the first year. Yeah, one stop the first year, three stops last year. Yeah. Uh, but we the first year, we actually played four games in Memphis with five subs. Last year, we played three tournaments, three games per tournament uh, with five subs. And this year, we're going two games per stop and seven subs. So it's going to be intense like ice hockey. Never played ice hockey <laughs> in my life, but it looks intense. <laughs> yeah, look, I, I think the expansion of an Eastern and a Western conference is very um, enticing to the watcher. I think, yeah, I mean, it's obviously will grow, but the it's not so much the amount of games, but the the time slot. So it's going to be end of the day, maybe four or five hours, so people can watch everything and get like kind of process it and understand it. The Olympics is two games a day. Obviously, it goes for bloody three days in a row, but um, it's it's a it's a different concept to three games. I feel I, f- I feel like it's quite different. Most World Series is three three. Olympics was two two two. I, I think it's a whole different ballpark mentally. So from where it's come, which was one stop, lots of games, to three stops, one less game, to, you know, this, I know you don't, a single player won't play every single one, but now there's five right. stops in total for all the teams and in, in tournaments, Eastern, Western, and then the combined final. That's really cool. I think that's a really good sign of the game. I don't know if this will be the final way that it works, the final layout, but in terms of growth, it's definitely going in the right direction. Because, I mean, it's got it's grown from four teams to eight teams. Like, that's cool. Like, that is so cool. I don't, yeah, I don't, like I said, I don't know if we had the sweet spot, but it's definitely a sign of really good things to come and that you that this tournament is doing things right. Yeah, and it makes for high drama. Like, straight away, you're in the semifinal, and it's like, you if you not don't arrive that first game, you're up. Done. See you later. Yeah, 100%. So, really cool. All right, Ruth, before we let you go, two quick fire things. First thing I want to ask about the color streak in your hair. What's the quick story behind that? Um, I Yeah, I got this done. My first ever Sevens Nationals in New Zealand, the women's comp got cut from 2002 to 2012, so for 10 years. 2012, um, made it back in, played for Canterbury. I actually wanted a big tattoo, but you've got to stop training, so I couldn't do it. You had to go on a sabbatical to get one. Wanted, then I was like, oh, no, I'll dye my hair. I wanted to dye all my hair. I was at uh, uni. I was a student, so this is all, all I could afford, to be honest. And then I yeah, represented Canterbury, which was red and black, ruby red, and I wanted to just express myself. Couldn't get a tat. Got this. And then I got told if I wanted to get into TV, which I really did to grow the game, I'd have to get rid of it. I was really upset about it, and I didn't know myself well enough Listen to them, got rid of it, I was gutted. And my whole career, I've been looking for some uh, time to bring it back. You can ask, like, Ty Nathan Wong, Caleb McAllister, any of them, they know because the hotels hated it. Uh, and then Rugby World Cup came, and I ha- I was at a point, I was like, you know what, if the TV don't want me, I, it's fine. 
brought it back and the TV didn't even care. So <laughs> that was a big lesson, like, just be you, fam. Just be you. That's so, right. That's yeah. right. I love it. I love it. Okay, before we let you go, quickly say Minneapolis, Minnesota. Oh, my goodness, bro. Mini apples, mini sodas. No way. There it is. Mini, done. Minneapolis, mi- Minnesota. I'll get there. I'll get. There. I need your help, Dylan. Uh, okay, brilliant. Well, listen. I want to say our time is up with the brilliant Ruby to be more elusive than the Loch Ness monster. We can't wait to see you at Q2 Stadium in Austin this Saturday, and then watch you carve in the PR Sevens on June 24th in Minneapolis, Minneapolis, and then July 15, San Jose, California, as well as the 2023 Championship. If all goes well in Washington D.C. Two in the house, shut the gates, keep the change. Thanks, team. We're going for them. Big apples. Thanks for having me and thanks for growing this beautiful game. Much love. Thanks for listening to the Rugby Sevens Roller Coaster. Visit PR7s.com to buy tickets to the five tournaments in 2023. Austin, Texas, June 17th. Minneapolis, Minnesota, June 24th. San Jose, California, July 15th. Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, July 23th and the PR7s Championship on August 6th. Connect with us on social media PR7s and watch any of the previous tournaments on the Premier Rugby 7s YouTube channel. See you next time, your sleek sensations.